Good afternoon, and welcome to this on-the-record World Economic Forum discussion, Rebooting the Global Economy. Global trade continues to decline, along with commodity prices. We ask what should be done by governments and industry to jumpstart world growth. I'm Matt Winkler, Editor-in-Chief of Bloomberg News and the moderator for this distinguished gathering of people before you who will help us find the answers. President of the Republic of the Philippines, Gloria Arroyo. Prime Minister of Thailand, Abhiset Bujajiwa. Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Ankel Guria. Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Oryx Corp, Japan's biggest non-bank financial institution, Yoshihiku Miyochi, General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, John Monks, and Professor Joseph Stieglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist at Columbia University. It is now apparent that Europe, Japan, and the United States couldn't prevent recession by increasing exports to the so-called BRIC countries any more than emerging markets decoupled from the G7. Yet there's no doubt we are ever more a G20 world, as Prime Minister Gordon Brown says, the meeting of these countries in London in April may prove to be the most important in its history. Earlier this week, my colleagues at Bloomberg News reported on international monetary fund figures for the global economy, showing little or no growth this year as more than $2 trillion of bad assets from the U.S. help undermine economies from Russia to the U.K. Bank losses worldwide from toxic U.S.-originated assets may reach $2.2 trillion, the IMF said, more than $1.4 trillion that the fund predicted in October. World growth will be 0.5 percent this year, the weakest pace since the end of the Second World War, the fund said in a separate report. This new data suggests the write-downs and losses at banks totaling $1.1 trillion so far are only 50 percent of what's to come and that contractions may deepen. Losses of such a scale would leave banks needing at least $500 billion in fresh capital to restore confidence in their balance sheets, the IMF said. Unless stronger financial strains and uncertainties are forcefully addressed, the pernicious feedback loop between real activity and financial markets will intensify, leading to even more toxic effects on global growth, the IMF said. The IMF's latest forecast revises its estimate of world growth down from 2.2 percent in November. U.S. gross domestic product will contract 1.6 percent. Japan will shrink 2.6 percent, and the euro area will decline 2 percent in 2009, the IMF said. The fund in November foresaw a 0.7 percent U.S. contraction with declines of 0.2 percent in Japan and 0.5 percent in the Eurozone. Leading the group of seven nations in contraction this year will be the UK economy, which the IMF predicted would slide 2.8 percent compared with the fund's forecast in November of a 1.3 percent drop. Global growth this year will come to a virtual standstill, said Olivier Blanchard, the IMF's chief economist. We need stronger policy on the financial front. In the U.S., President Barack Obama is negotiating with Congress on a plan worth $825 billion that includes tax cuts and spending projects to pull the world's largest economy out of a 13-month recession. The Federal Reserve continues to use emergency credit programs rather than interest rates to arrest the financial crisis. The European Central Bank has cut its benchmark interest rate by 2.25 percentage points since early October to 2 percent, matching a record low. Governments are also beginning to ease fiscal policy as the 16-nation euro region suffers its worst recession since the single currency began trading almost a decade ago.
advanced and developing countries need to be given more supportive be more supportive of demand than they already have been with lower interest rates and fiscal stimulus the i m f said and the fund urged timely passage of fiscal aid saying any delays will worsen growth prospects the obama administration and federal regulators are considering setting up a bad bank that would absorb illiquid assets from otherwise healthy financial firms the i m f said the restructuring process might involve the use of publicly owned bad bank to remove distressed assets from the balance sheets of institutions the fund also said that banks needed at least five hundred billion dollars in new cash just to prevent their capital position from deteriorating further downside risks continue to dominate and the scale and scope of financial crisis that we're witnessing has taken the global global economy into uncharted waters china's economy will likely expand six point seven percent this year the i m f said reducing its estimate for the world's fastest growing economy from eight point five percent in november russia will contract zero point seven percent this year and that's compared with a three and a half percent expansion the i m f predicted as recently as november the i m f report said inflation in advanced economies may fall to a record low of zero point three percent this year from a prediction of three point six percent in november the average price of oil may be fifty dollars a barrel this year the i m f said less than the sixty eight dollars a barrel that was forecast just three months ago companies around the world are cutting workers by the thousands and they're raising the risk of even weaker consumer spending s a p in germany the world's biggest maker of business management software said it will lose more than three thousand jobs this year caterpillar sprint nextel corp home depot i n g all were a part of a string of companies that said they would eliminate seventy four thousand jobs during the past week so as we begin the year we see globalization without global governance yet nobody can be independent as even here in switzerland during the banking crisis it is said the traditional notion of switzerland doesn't exist anymore mr guria as mexico's former finance minister and minister of foreign affairs you have as much experience dealing with economic calamities on a bilateral and multilateral basis as anyone where are we right now and what is the tactical need that g20 need to do as we begin the second month of the year well i think uh, given the progress that you've been reading uh, i told john this don't go out and uh, rent your clothes sir you know um, at least let's not do it publicly um, i am uh, more encouraged than when i arrived here and basically because we know the numbers we know what was happening the numbers are going to get worse as the year goes by that was in the cards the question is what do we do now and what i find is that there's great awareness and there is great disposition to act in cooperative uh, and in uh, coordinated fashion. And uh, the famous phrase of Gordon Brown in the labor conference of whatever it takes seems to be, very frankly, the order of the day and shared by uh, the rest of the leaders. So, as I say, I'm more encouraged. Now, what will it take? I think it'll take uh, three or four things. The first one is uh, get the banks back on their feet and lending. It's not only sufficient to get them, you know, out of the bankruptcy process uh, or bankruptcy threat, get them to lend. Uh, uh, because without the lending, it's not, it is, the recovery is not going to happen, the conveyor belt is not going to work. There was massive failure on the regulatory side, supervisory side, corporate governance side, risk management side. Let's fix that simply to make sure that it doesn't happen again, not to apportion blame, but mostly to get the banks working again. Now, this question in the newspapers today about the bad bank and the good bank, it's not a theoretical question. We were going to buy, with all those packages, we were going to buy the bad assets, remove the radioactivity, and then we were going to capitalize the, the, the good banks. Now, we didn't. We changed course suddenly. In the United States in particular, they decided to go for the capitalization without removing. Now, they found out that those radioactive assets continue to emit the ugly light. It's a Pac-Man, you know, it's eating the capital that you throw at it. You gotta take it away. You gotta separate the two in order to get capitalized 
and recover the confidence in the banks. Otherwise, the funding of the banks themselves is not going to happen easily. This is why the massive return to central banks of all the liquidity that massively is being injected every day by the central banks in the banking system. So that's a, a very obvious uh, thing to do. And, uh, the bad bank and good bank means eventually there's going to be losses that have to be taken. Yes, but that was the idea in the beginning. You know, in Mexico we took about 18% of GDP losses when we had this type of problem. Uh, but then you, you you got it going. So uh, this this is what we we have to do here. The second thing, the the, the other thing is that these packages that we're doing. Uh, are they big enough? We don't know. Very frankly, you can come back to the well if they weren't big enough. But uh, there's one and a half percent. The fund probably said it's two percent. They need half percent more. Well, we'll see. But I'm more worried about the quality of the uh, uh, stimulus packages, the targeting, so they have the most effective bang for the buck type of thing in terms of uh, uh, recover the activity and jobs. This crisis is about jobs. You know, uh, the ILO says. 20 to 50 million jobs. Well, that's a bit of a variance, you know, there. But let's take the middle ground, you know, take 35 million. To, it is a massive, massive uh, tragedy and it's a massive catastrophe in terms of jobs. Men, women, children, people who can't pay the mortgages, can't pay the tuitions, and can't buy food. And, and that is something we should not lose track of. And this is why political leaders have to uh, intervene in the process and make that macroeconomic stimulus as good as possible. They have to be big, yes, uh, but they have to be smart also. But does everybody have the same capacity? No, because some people are starting with a 2% surplus and some people are starting with a 3 or 4% deficit. We already know some of the countries are going to go to uh, the biggest, some of the biggest economies in the world, close to 10% deficits. How do you solve that in terms of confidence? Well, basically, the kinds of things that are being done in Germany, where it said, we're going to have the biggest deficit ever. We don't like it. It's a tough political decision. But now they're talking about a balanced budget amendment in the Constitution. Ah, well, that bridges the thing very well. And it even gives credibility to the short term to a much greater extent than if you just leave it alone and say, what are we going to do next? In the UK, they announced that the a, a reduction in the VAT, maybe revert it later, or some other taxes, maybe... Uh, uh, modified in order to uh, recover the debt, the increase in the debt and the revenues that is going to be lost. That is as, mu as, as important as uh, the packages themselves because today there's a lot of the, but, I mean, countries are being downgraded. Countries which were a decade had a surplus are being downgraded by the rating agencies. I consider that a very pendular movement by the rating agencies, but, but it's happening every day. Uh, they, of course, have to do their own thing internally, but then last uh, you know, we have these big stimulus packages that say, it's going to be green, you know. Well, yes, well, you know, it's great. It's a great opportunity. And it's going to create the jobs. So let's take the, 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 the political uh, leaders at the word, you know, and, and make sure that these are effective in those two, um, in those two uh, uh, senses. But also, let's not forget about our real, medium, and long-term uh, duties and uh, our medium and long-term missions, the ones we were embarking on before the crisis struck. You know, how are we going to do the crisis? Uh, how are we going to do poverty? How are we going to do things like uh, climate change if we can't do Doha? Doha is a low-hanging fruit. Doha is there to, you know, to pick it up. Uh, uh, we have to do Doha in order to do then, uh, do these all medium and long-term uh, 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 missions and visions that we saw, we cannot let the crisis distract us and be used as an excuse to forget our uh, medium and long-term duties. Thank you. Madam President, um, as past chair of the ASEAN, you perhaps have had a special Asian perspective on the importance of global trade that is reinforced by your own experience with remittances re redistributed to uh, the Philippines economy. What do you see as the best approach do we need to jumpstart the multilateral uh, approach like Doha, or can we find comfort in um, a new regionalism of trade if we don't do Doha? Well, first of all, what's the best approach to rebooting the world economy? That's the title of our session today. And 
when you talk about rebooting the global economy, that suggests something pretty radical. Because when you reboot a computer, you have to turn it off first. But when we reboot an economy, we cannot turn it off. We cannot wipe the slates clean before we can start all over again. Because there are people involved, there are lives involved. So what is very important here is that we must not neglect uh, those who uh, feel the hardship of the um, global downturn the most, and that is the poor. And any, any solution must take that into account. So um, in the Philippines, uh, we took our bitter medicine years ago when we had our very painful fiscal reforms and financial reforms. So when the world crisis struck, we had the revenues to be able to invest in people as well as in infrastructure for the fiscal stimulus. And uh, that is why in uh, 2007, we had an 8% GNP growth, and in 2008, a 6% GNP growth. But uh, having said that, and making sure that, uh, that any radical change is not at the back of, of uh, is not on the back of those who can least afford it, we do need radical rethinking in the world. Number one, uh, we need a fundamental reform of the global financial regulation. Number two, uh, Doha must continue, must be completed. And that is where the interests of the developing countries can take the rightful place in the global structure of the, of the economy. And third, the G7 must expand into a G20 or even a G30. Mr. Prime Minister, on that, on that point, you are the current chairman of Asia, no stranger to elections in your own backyard. But if we look at the elections elsewhere around the world, and the most recent one in the U.S., on uh, just that point that uh, uh, Madam President has just raised, should we move to a more open G7? How and what will the mechanism be for us to expand truly to a, G a G20 world? Well, first of all, um, I think this emphasis on coordination is, is essential. Uh, from our experience during the last financial crisis, which was in 1997, where we were at the center of it. And our experience now suggests that uh, more coordination is still needed for one thing. Um, we see clearly that uh, the problems facing various economies are actually different, but related. Uh, the case of Thailand is clear. We, our financial system has been in good health following the restructuring since the last crisis. Uh, and yet now uh, we are hit by declining exports and tourist income. Uh, tourism is down 20 percent, which is exactly in line with the decline in global travel. Our exports registered um, 17 percent and 12 percent decline in the last two months of last year. Um, and now, despite the fact that the financial system is in good health and there is plenty of liquidity in the system, uh, the banks begin to stop lending, uh, even to perfectly good businesses uh, before this happened. So uh, while the, the major economies have to deal with the immediate impact of the financial <clears throat> crisis, uh, many developing and emerging economies are now feeling the effect in the real sector. And uh, there are, I think, some key um, lessons to be learned from the previous crisis and uh, some key thoughts in terms of coordination. Uh, first, um, every single economy will go through its own political difficulties in putting the stimulus package together, fiscal and monetary policy. Um, the lesson to be learned is that you have to do things as quickly as possible. And uh, sometimes that means spending a lot of taxpayers' money. But if you do too little, too late, you have to do it again and again, and it becomes more and more politically difficult when you try to do it the second, the third, the fourth time, because the public, the public runs out of patience and begins uh, to believe that all this isn't working. Secondly, uh, because each economy will have its own uh, timing for its package, what we, can, uh, what we might see are volatility in the movement of exchange rates and possibility of misalignment. Uh, added to that, there will be a temptation to move to 
more protectionist mode, or even perhaps uh, a temptation to try to depreciate your own currency to, to export your way out of the crisis. That's the last thing we need. That's why it's uh, imperative that uh, the G20 in April uh, will have to make good on its pledge that uh, all the monetary and fiscal uh, stimulus packages will be in place in a timely manner and that uh, everybody will, will pledge not to resort to protectionism. And they should push ahead with the Doha agreements and the various regional groupings uh, will, should do whatever they can while at the same time recognize that the initiatives taken by various regional groups are not substitute for a more uh, global effort at, at coordination. So I was uh, encouraged by Prime Minister Gordon Brown's comment yesterday that the G20 will deliver on its, uh, on its promise and more importantly that he's uh, willing to open up the process so that all voices are heard. I would just finally end uh, by, by saying that uh, even before we can think about the longer term uh, fixes in terms of uh, preventive measures and maybe a new institutional setting at the global level. Uh, we have to be very quick at preventing this crisis from spreading to the poorer parts of the world. Uh, the last thing we need is uh, uh, suffering from the poor that leads to social and political tensions that could become flashpoints and conflicts in the world which will make it all the more difficult for all major economies to actually deal with the current crisis. Given that there's so much, Mr. Monks, riding on, it seems, G20, within the traditional G7, we have an over-concentration of, uh, of Europeans. And um, must Europe give way to the G20? Um, is resistance a path to protectionism in a period of rapidly rising job losses? I think it's absolutely right to move towards G20. But uh, nor should uh, Europe, in a sense, have a, a sense of itself as maybe uh, sliding gracefully or otherwise into the margins a little bit. It's still round about one, the European Union is about one third of the world economy, so that it's a big chunk. And it needs to be very much part of the solutions to the problems. So there's, uh, uh, there's every reason for expanding. Uh, the existing arrangements of the uh, G7, G8, uh, but the, uh, uh, Europe will continue, I'm sure, to play a very big part. It's, it's slightly bigger in GDP terms than uh, the United States. So uh, I don't think um, uh, expect it to uh, recede much, but to be more inclusive is right. The risk of uh, protectionism is very, very real. Um, and, uh, and, and this goes back to something Gordon Brown was saying this morning about the financial area, uh, that we've got a global economy, but people in trouble look to their governments for sustenance. Where else can they go? That's what democracy is about. And I, people have been talking about, is it 1929, is it 1931, uh, and so, is it 1989? For me, it's a bit more like 1945, where in the, out of the wreckage of the Second World War, people looked at their governments to steer them out of the mess the world had got itself into. And so I think uh, we've seen banks scurrying for, for cover with their national governments. We've seen car companies uh, scurrying for cover with their national governments and others. And some arrangements are beginning to be made in relation to important industrial sectors which frankly look rather protectionist. Uh, and that includes within the European Union, by the way. So, I mean, I think there's a real worry, and those of you, and you, I think most people here will know the history of the 1930s, know that protectionism played a part in uh, the tensions of uh, that rather disastrous decade. Um, and I do think um, that the, uh, it's going to be important to fight for uh, uh, the uh, free trade approach, to keep uh, things open, but don't underestimate the difficulties that politicians with the best of intentions are going to be under. That when a major manufacturer says, we're going to close unless you give us that, um, what, and there's lots of jobs at stake, and the major regional economies at stake, maybe a national economy, uh, what are they going to do? And they're going to try, and people are, that are going to expect to be looked after just as much as the banks have been expected to be looked after.
So it's going to be a rough, rough ride. And I feel that we are, in a sense, it feels like we're almost in the middle of a recession when you're talking about it all the time at Davos. Uh, we're, not the, we're just at the beginning of the real effects of this uh, uh, recession. Uh, and the unemployment j figures are now coming in after the new year on a daily basis, and they're going to go on rising for a long time yet. Um, and uh, so this is going to be a rough ride. The more uh, the heads of state uh, uh, can keep together and keep this sense that we've got to coordinate, we're not trying to do beggar thy neighbor policies, the better. But it's going to be tough, and don't underestimate the difficulties. And don't underestimate the social tensions that are beginning to come up. Anger about the banks. It's all a bit inchoate and a bit uh, incoherent at the moment. But that was a lot of people on the streets of France on, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, last week, on Thursday. More than just about anybody expected about a week ago. The mood is changing a bit in a number of countries. And it's going to get a lot more difficult before it gets easy. Mr. Miyochi. You know, from your perch in Japan and experience with the deflation of the 90s and the prospect of its recurrence, how should we deal with, for example, the consumption in America right now is shrinking from more than 70 percent of gross domestic product to current forecasts of about 67 percent. And some even say it will get as low as 60 percent, which uh, some of us would consider shocking. The question is, do we just assume that to reboot the economy, we must see a consumption buildup across the world outside the U.S.? Do we presume we must have this consumption buildup everywhere except the U.S.? I think uh, Japan experienced a uh, lost decade, and at that time, uh, most of the consumer lost uh, confidence of, for the future, so that they save, they start saving. And uh, we experienced the long term of the deflationary trend in the economy. So if, uh, I don't think it will apply to the U.S. economy today, but uh, if uh, U.S. Uh, consumers uh, lost confidence, I don't think they will continue to waste, I mean, uh, consume like uh, they used to do. So that uh, if you mentioned, may maybe uh, they contract 5%, uh, consumption go up to 65% from 70, or 10%, 60% uh, from 70, this gap cannot be fulfilled by, by themselves. So if the uh, world continues to, to grow, somebody must fulfill this uh, uh, gap. I think uh, people are worrying about uh, this uh, financial turmoil, and some people pray for the coming back to the old days. But I don't think uh, uh, new era does not have the same scenery we had in the past. Uh, in the new system, I really like to see some uh, small multiple engines like uh, China, India, Asian country, Japan, uh, become a little bit bigger engine for the world economy and uh, do not expect much from the United States. But I don't think uh, we can uh, make a new world by increase of consumption by those countries. At the same time, we need to have a new investment, new type of investment. I think a new, new type of investment must connect with uh, environmental solutions. For instance, many Japanese companies, they are suffering from a decline of uh, export recently, but at the same time, they are trying to utilize their new technology and research power to apply to uh, produce uh, new products like uh, hybrid cars, uh, electronic uh, motor cars, or solar electricity. So if uh, we have a small number of other engines for the consumption purpose, and uh, industry try to bring in some uh, new product in the world which will clean up uh, CO problems and also contribute to the, to the, to the f future years, future young people. Professor Stieglitz, you have had an inside view as a policymaker in your previous role as chief economist at the World Bank, and you've never hesitated to identify the hazards of errant policymaking during economic upheavals. You said earlier this week that stupidity was one of the causes of the current crisis. <laughs> stupidity on whose part? <laughs> 
That's not a refined analysis, but on a part of everybody, let me just give you a couple examples. One of the basic precepts in economics teaching the first course is there's no such thing as a free lunch. Many of the banks thought that they could, through high leverage, get a high return without risk. You take a 20, 30 to 1 leverage, a small percentage change in the price of your asset, and you're wiped out. And they were betting that even though it was clear we were having a housing bubble, that the prices wouldn't go down. But now we're talking about a decline in housing prices of 30 percent or possibly more. And that goes back to the depth of the numbers that you were referring to in the IMF numbers. We don't really know how bad, because if the prices continue to decline and nothing's been done about the foreclosure, those gaps are going to get even larger. The regulators also were stupid. And Greenspan almost admitted as much. They believed that people were rational and they didn't need, they could, self-regulation, which is an oxymoron, would work. And it was so clear, as they were undertaking this excessive risk, that they were putting at risk the whole economy. But what's so interesting about this is, given the incentive structures, there's every reason for the banks, the bank officers, to undertake those. So we created incentive structures that would lead to excessive lending, exactly what we got. It was rational in that sense. It was irrational for the regulators not to realize that rational responses to bad incentive structures was going to lead us to a problem. But now I'll just give you a couple more examples. Right now, we finally learned that the pro-cyclical policies that the IMF imposed on Thailand in 97, Indonesia, all around the world, were bad. So we're having counter-cyclical policies, lowering interest rates, expansionary fiscal policy. But what is the IMF still doing in a number of countries, including some that are very strategically important, like Pakistan, pro-cyclical policies, high interest rates, business can't get any capital, you know, on top of the current crisis. So that's an example where they seem to be very slow to learn the lesson. Let me just give one more example. One of the other precepts that we give in, you know, second lecture in economics, you shouldn't, you know, bygones are bygones. You shouldn't chase good money after bad money. Well, just think for a minute. If we had taken the $700 billion we talked about in TARP and created a new bank looking forward, not looking at the past, but looking forward, and leveraged that just 12 to 1, that would have generated $8.4 trillion of new credit. No problem with credit supply if we have been forward-looking rather than backward-looking. Now, one of the ideas that I think is a bad idea is the bad bank. I know there's some disagreement on that. But the bad bank idea is just the new version of the old idea that was discarded, I thought, which was the cash for trash, where we would take on all the assets that no one else would touch, and somehow the government is a better garbage disposer than the private sector. This coming from a lot of people who believe that the government shouldn't do anything, that why government should have a special facility in garbage disposal. The new version of this is bulk buying garbage in bulk. So we buy huge amounts of garbage, and then we become a bulk disposer of garbage. Now, the problem with the new garbage, you know, the experiences of the past are important, but the new garbage is different from any of the old garbage that we've ever dealt with. And that's because it includes these explosive toxic derivatives. And think about what that means. We've given $150 billion to AIG, one company, and most of that money has disappeared. Now, that's one company. Now, we take on all those derivatives, and I don't know if you remember the numbers that were floating around, $20 trillion, $30 trillion, $40 trillion, and you put them on the U.S. taxpayer, 
We never had a responsibility. We had a responsibility for the S&Ls. We had deposit insurance. We never gave deposit insurance. We never said we would provide backstop for these credit default swaps. But that's what we would be doing, in effect, if we assumed all those bad assets onto the public balance sheet. So we have to figure out what to do with those and not put them on the public balance sheet. Our national deficit, national debt, has already increased from $5.7 trillion when Bush became the president to over $10 trillion. With this, you know, even if we do the right thing, we're talking about several, you know, $5, $7 trillion more. If we don't do it right, we're talking about a national debt that is very hard to manage. And then you talk about the issue that several people have mentioned, tensions. Already in the United States, it mentioned a cutting back in Social Security when we've been giving all the bankers, the banks, the money. We would have put Social Security on a sound financial basis for 100 years or more with the money that we've been spending on the banks. So now you're asking what the tradeoff here, giving all the old age people in America security for the next 100 years versus bailing out a few banks. And that's the bad bank idea. And if you go ahead with that, I think it raises real issues about social values. Mr. Duria. Duria, do you, do you agree that the bad bank is uh, an idea whose time has passed? <clears throat> I think, uh, was it Churchill who said it was a terrible democracy, was a terrible way to run countries except for everything else. This is, this is uh, it's not good, it's not, we don't do it uh, with a smile on our face, and we don't like to do it. Uh, it's done because it has to be done. The problem with the alternative is that the banks simply will not function. They will not do what they're supposed to do, which is they will not lend. And the reason I wouldn't even call them toxic assets or the radioactive because everybody thinks this is a package as a subprime. These are, I would call, illiquid assets that don't have a price, that don't have a market. And the reason why they continue to erode the capital and they continue to contaminate is because if there is no price and there is no market, they continue to be marked down all the time. And because of the accounting practices, the banks end up without having, you know, tested whether the asset is good or not. It bankrupt, effectively. And then the governments have to come in and put the money, and then because the assets are still there, the, the whole portfolio of the banks, not just the bad assets, continue to lose price. So the question is, removing the bad apples, I mean, it's a biblical thing, it's a, it's a classic, you know, it's just a, uh, and not because you like it, but because it's really uh, the only way in which you're going to get a systemic service, which is, the, 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 it's not bailing out banks for everybody. It's not, the shareholders can lose all their money. The problem is that banks leverage themselves because we allowed them to. This is a system we have built 10 times, 12 times to one dollar that the shareholders lose. And the other 10 times, because the deposit insurance systems are not big enough, we have created the debt, are now out there. And if you don't remove some of that, you know, some of that paper, uh, I, I agree that this is equivalent to buying uh, a, a garbage uh, at bulk. The problem is we don't know uh, uh, if uh, there is more garbage or less in the rest of the banks. And in order to get the banks to be funded and lend, you have to remove that part. You completely make the situation transparent. Eventually, uh, in the combination of uh, what price you buy them or how do you divide the losses, you will see if there are, uh, you know, social losses or not. But eventually the question is who takes the losses and eventually, unfortunately, the only ones who can do this. It's, it's socially uh, very, very bad, but the problem is the alternative uh, may be worse. This is the only, this is the only case I, I share with all the, the moral and the ethical concerns. Um, I think the, 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 the only concern is whether it would be worse if we don't do it. And we, we don't do it fast, by the way. And this is why we skipped it. Part two, we skipped it. We wanted to skip. TARP was going to be to buy asset first, all of it. And then they decided, because of the difficulties and the practical problems of pricing and the l transparent uh, of the losses, they decided to go to the third stage, which is just to put capital. And now they're going back.
No coincidence. If they don't remove the acids, the illiquid acids, and this is in Spain, and this is even in countries where the banks are in good shape, relatively. This is not just uh, where there was subprime. Mr. Monks, you share the, the same perspective? Well, I've got a lot of sympathy with a letter that was in the Financial Times a few days ago, which said, I don't know about bad banks, it would be quite nice to find a good bank uh, somewhere. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, that we've got enough bad banks uh, around the Western world at the moment. Uh, if anybody's short of one, we can su supply some from the United Kingdom at the, at the present time. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm no, uh, no expert on banking, but I, again, I feel that uh, the, the, the sense that, that Joe Stiglitz has, uh, has expressed, we don't know what we're getting into. I mean, I saw that the Swedes did this for their bank rescue um, yeah. a few years ago, and they did it very well. But it was, as, as, as was admitted by the, uh, the, 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 the central bank governor, I mean, they knew what they were buying. They knew there were dodgy properties in Uppsala or somewhere. They, it was a small country. People knew what the bad debts or likely bad debts might be. We haven't got a clue uh, in the big countries where, the, and we don't know where these debts are. I don't think some of the banks fully know their exposure to the subprime market at the moment. I'm not sure they know their exposure to the, uh, the business leveraging, the high levels of leveraging that are around, particularly private equity, a lot of which uh, 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 have to be repaid quite soon. Some of the, the private equity boom have got, to, have got to repay. They don't know what's going to happen if unemployment rockets, as it might, uh, how many people are going to be able to pay their credit card bills and how many people are going to be able to pay their mortgages and what repossessions will take place. They don't know. And the idea that somehow the uh, munificent taxpayers standing with their arms open give us your rubbish uh, and so on, I think is, is very dangerous. I, and I, the, 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 I come back to this point. We're beginning to get very close to straining the patience of the population and the voter and everybody else in this area. The, our grandchildren will be paying some of these debts already incurred. And uh, I, so the, don't take for granted that this is a technical issue anymore. I've got a feeling it's, it's going to run a lot, more, uh, a lot hotter and a lot more widely than this. And rather than experts talking about things, people are going to get the social unrest is going to start chipping in quite quickly. And politicians will find themselves scrambling through, uh, uh, pragmatically through whatever circumstances they face which comes back to that danger of uh, protectionism and trying to get yourself in a Swedish position so you, at least you know what you're doing. At the moment, you don't know what you're doing, not with the great big banks of the Western world and where their possible toxic assets lie. Madam President, when you hear all of this consternation and confusion mostly within the G7 about bad banks and uh, the difficulty in dealing with uh, this unraveling financial system, mostly in the G7 economies. How do you have any optimism that we are going to move to a G20 regime when there's so much obsession at the moment within the G7 with its own peculiar problems? Well, um, I, as uh, the others have said in this table, in this platform, the meeting of the G20 on, in April is going to be a very important meeting, so that's already one. Uh, that's already one indication how important and how useful the G20 can be. But we must even go beyond the G20 because we need to have represented in the coordinated policy making of the world diverse kinds of economies. Because if we don't have these diverse economies represented on the table, then perspective will be lost and new ideas will not be gained. And furthermore, it is ironic that the developing countries now are doing better than the developed countries. And yet, if they will not have a say in how to structure the world economy, that's really wrong. So we need to have the developing countries represented uh, in, a, in a bigger way. They have something to share uh, how, how are they able to uh, keep their countries resilient? They have that to share. 
And uh, another way by which we make the G20 or the G30 uh, more successful or assure its success is that it should be complemented by the, by the um, regional alliances being consulted more closely and being meshed together among themselves. And Mr. Prime Minister, do you think you could identify, say, three policies that would capture the Asian response at this point to this global unraveling, especially in the context of this growing threat of protectionism? Yep. The first thing is uh, uh, the, the regional um, groupings must reaffirm their commitments in terms of keeping market access for, for all the partners. And uh, the, the regional groupings should, should uh, coordinate among different regions to make sure that there is also global coordination uh, in terms of trade flows and in terms of macroeconomic response. Um, the second thing that I think is important uh, is that we mustn't lose sight of the, the real sector. Um, you know, whatever the debates about the good banks and the bad banks, I can tell you that once, even if this was perfectly done and you've, you've removed all the assets, I don't believe the good banks will begin to resume lending automatically. There will be this environment uh, of a risk attitude mm -hmm. that, that will not actually uh, facilitate lending unless additional steps are taken, for instance, some kind of uh, guarantee schemes that may have to come not just from national governments but also some kind of agreements uh, between nations. Uh, that's important because um, if we take longer in solving all the financial side, at the same time we let the real economy slide, you will find that uh, having cleaned up the first round, there will be more bad assets, there will be more businesses that would have been good but are now turning bad. And that brings us to the, to the, to the third point, uh, which is whether there will be social tensions, whether there will be anger, especially with some of the controversial, inevitably controversial moves that people have to make, is ultimately do ordinary people feel that the solution is working? If after all the taxpayers' money is spent, you've cleaned everything up, but ordinary people don't see better prospects for their lives, I think there will still be anger. But on the other hand, if we manage to, to, to get all the countries through the crisis and ordinary people felt that the taxpayers' money had been spent to keep the system alive, I think there would not be anger and they would come to understand the necessity of, of all the actions that had been taken. Professor Stieglitz again, in your books, Civilization and Its Discontents, Making Globalization Work, you show why governments are essential in guiding the process of bringing greater prosperity to the world. As we move to this G20 world, what should that process be? And will the speed with which the subprime crisis spilled across borders prompt countries to raise barriers to capital as well as trade? Are we potentially at a tipping point that will turn the tide of global financial integration? Well, uh, first, I, I think there are serious problems. Uh, and we see it already in the fact that uh, there are capital uh, flows going back from the developing to the developed countries. And you can understand that if the U.S. provides a guarantee in its depositors, uh, but developing countries, even if they provided the guarantee, it won't have the same credibility. So in effect, uh, the subsidies, the guarantees have made what was already an unlevel playing field even more unlevel. And uh, the irony, uh, you know, in the G20 uh, uh, statement they made a big deal about not having protectionist measures but then in the stimulus package that the US Congress the House passed but has not yet gone through there's a provision that uh, only US made steel would be used uh, and that's obviously very very disturbing coming on uh, top of a statement that from the G20 that they weren't going to engage in these practices uh, and I'd say on top of unintentional issues like the guarantees which were not on it, intentionally unleveling the playing field, doing exactly uh, that. 
Now, I think uh, the G20 was a, a major step forward. It was a, effectively a recognition by the G7 that uh, they didn't have the money, <laughs> that the liquid money was in Asia, was in the Middle East, but uh, we spent it all. So in a sense, it was a recognition of, of the new realities. But uh, it had a no has a number of flaws. Um, it's not really representative, and I think several people have already mentioned this. Uh, it was an arbitrary selected group, uh, better than seven, but still not representative. Uh, poor countries in Africa don't have representation. Uh, so I think that what we need uh, to do going forward uh, is uh, to uh, pursue some of the ideas that, for instance, uh, 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 Chancellor Merkel, Merkel have raised of, of a global economic management. Uh, 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 I would like to see this within the UN, which is the one international institution that has legitimacy, uh, that one can create a, a, a context in which uh, maybe more with moral uh, authority uh, than with uh, uh, power in the usual sense, but to lay out the agenda of what needs to be done. We need a reform of the global reserve system, uh, we need, uh, for instance, uh, a, a global bankruptcy regime to deal with cross-border uh, bankruptcy. But it can't be done by an institution reflecting the creditor uh, countries. Uh, and, and so there is actually a, a rich agenda, uh, but we really have to have a more balanced uh, representation. Several people have mentioned the Doha round, which began as a development round, but I can't help but point out uh, that even though it began as a development round, it uh, was really turned out to putting old wine into new bottles and have very little development benefits. In fact, in some areas, it was having adverse effects on some developing countries. And even the World Bank recognized that the develop net development benefits were relatively little by the time we got to where, where we are. Uh, and in my book, I, one of my books, I, I pointed out, it doesn't even deserve anymore to be called a development round. So we really need to get away from, you know, uh, we've, there's all these statements about inclusive growth and having uh, all the countries involved, but we have to have governing structures that reflect that. And we continue to have in the IMF, the World Bank, the same ways of choosing the leaders, the same flaws uh, that we've had all along. Can we uh, answer some of the questions from uh, the gallery here? Uh, yes, sir. I think there are microphones, so. Yes, my name is Jack Rogosinski. I work for Inter-American Investment Corporation in DC. Uh, Professor Stiglitz was talking that um, the financial institutions, the financial system was betting and taking very high risks. Uh, but uh, were they doing that because they wanted or they did that because the pressure, because of pressure that was exerted by shareholders that wanted higher and higher returns. That, that is, um, are the incentives in the system creating this phenomena at the micro level of each financial institution that then is translated at the macro level to this economy mess that we have today? Yeah, that, that's a very good question because it highlights that the problem is not just a question uh, with the financial sector. It goes fairly deeply into corporate governance. I mentioned before that incentive structures were given to the bank managers that led to bad lending practices, but it also goes uh, to uh, the problem that they had in shareholder value, short-run focus, that encouraged uh, this kind of uh, belief that the we had to get shareholder returns up without real recognition of the risks that they were undertaking. So it really is a, a, a quite comprehensive indictment of, of the way the market economy has been working. Yes, sir. In the front row. <clears throat> My name is Mike Johnston. I'm <clears throat> from the United States, the Capital Group Companies. Uh, my question, I think, is to Mr. Stieglitz and Mr. Guria about bank bailouts. If, in fact, bad banks, according to Mr. Gurry, is a bad solution, but the only one available among even worse solutions, but if Joe Stieglitz, if you're right, uh, it's so bad that we shouldn't even risk that, 
is there in fact another alternative and specifically uh, should we nationalize the big U.S. banks, uh, which presumably would mean that the debtors of the banks would be wiped out as would the shareholders, but the depositors would come out whole. Or do we run a risk, as we did with Lehman, that something that radical would set in motion a whole series of events we can't predict? Well, one of the problems with Lehman Brothers is they didn't do their homework ahead of time. They didn't realize some of the fall-on consequences, for instance, with the money market funds. Uh, they should have done that. Uh, it's not rocket science, and uh, that will need to be done. But I think the answer is that the only way really of uh, addressing this is to use what uh, the market economy has always used, which is bankruptcy provisions with uh, guarantees for depositors, focusing, targeting the systematic where, where there's going to be problems, uh, like in money markets that we've extended guarantees, so we effectively have deposit insurance far more broadly. But what we're doing recently is basically a version of trickle-down economics. Throw enough money at it, and we don't know where exactly it goes, but somehow magically it's supposed to solve the problem. Uh, the fact is if we target it more closely to where we really need the money to go in systemic risk, not just giving money to insurance companies or anybody that might be related to systemic risk. I think we, we can do a better job looking forward, and this uh, uh, echoes what the Prime Minister said, looking forward to making, using our money to provide some guarantees to encourage lending uh, and uh, reducing the risk of our national debt getting out of bound. The, the, uh, forgive me, just the problem is you need both. Today you need both. And you mentioned the one case that has to be in people's mind. When did the turbulence become a crisis? The day Lehman Brothers was allowed to go bankrupt. Whether the Lehman Brothers people have done their homework or not is completely irrelevant. You're assuming it washes out all the shareholding value of the shareholders. The problem is that 10 to 12 to 15 times more that is out there that is accruing with no the deposit insurance doesn't exist today in that size. So you have to, what the governments are doing now is effectively saying nobody will go and lose their money because they had savings in a bank in the United States. And of course, the ones who said first no bank will go bankrupt was when the Northern Rock happened here many months before the thing got so tough. So the whole concept of not allowing any institution of systemic importance to go bust was a deliberate decision, and the decision was taken because of the public benefit, not because of the shareholders. But in Joe's comments, it looks like it's an alternative to choose between putting the money there and, and getting the bad assets away or capitalizing the banks, and the other one is getting these guarantees. You effectively need both. What are the basic banking operations? Inner bank, blocked, paralyzed. I mean, for heaven's sake, the, the Federal Reserve opened a discount window for commercial paper, which is working capital for companies. The banks weren't doing that either. Trade financing, blocked. You can't get a letter of credit. You can't get Exim banks to get the bank in the first tier to lend the money. Now Exim banks are getting 50, 60, 70, 80, now 100%, and you can't even get a bank to fund with a 90% guarantee. So basically, it is because the confidence level has not returned. And, you know, extraordinary situations, this is a cliche now, require extraordinary decisions. And, and I just have to, I, I agree with, with Joe and everybody who mentions and John Monks about the moral, the ethical, the political fallout. The political fallout is enormous. Maybe that's why they decided to skip step two in the tarp and go to step three, because they thought they could avoid the tougher part. The problem is you can't. You can't. You got to face the music, and eventually somebody has to take the losses. It's the only way to jumpstart the economy and get it all back. And it's for what? It's not to get the banks. What happens if a bank is closed or open? Nothing. It's to get the economy moving. It's to get the jobs back. We have a question back here. Thank you. I'm Nelson Schwartz of the New York Times. I have a question for uh, Mrs. Uh, Macapago Arroyo and Senor Gurria. 
given your experience in developing economies i'm curious if you're concerned about the united states approach here in terms of the amount of borrowing it looks like washington is about to embark on more than two trillion dollars and whether that will crowd out funds available for countries like the philippines and and for mexico and at the same time uh, there seems like there's some signs of protectionism and i'm curious again from uh, emerging countries how you feel about that especially when it was u.s borrowing and u.s excesses that most leaders are willing to say was like, like even gordon brown are willing to say was the origins of this crisis thank you well um with regard to the credit market and the crowding out actually as far as the philippine government is concerned we've already financed our needs for the rest of the year so we're not worried about that and as far as the private sector is concerned uh, we have a lot of liquidity in our Philippine banking system. In fact, uh, in our fiscal stimulus package that we have, the, the, the private banks are going to be a very important part of it. Uh, what I'm saying is that um, internal strength is very important to protect ourselves from external shocks. And, um, and part of that external shock would be the dis disappearance of all these funds available to us if uh, a giant like the United States would, uh, take, you know, would take it. So uh, we've, fortunately, we've, ha we've done our homework, we've taken our bitter pill, and, and that's why uh, what we want is for America to do something, because the last thing we want is for America to do nothing. You may debate on what should be done, but the worst thing is for it not to do anything. Uh, now, uh, the other question was with regard to, uh, what was it? The, um, that this originated in America with American excess and American, uh, too much American borrowing and, uh, yes, and whether yes. oh, the rest of the world pays the price, but we can print dollars. Yes, yes. Well, um, that, uh, of course we know that America is by far the, well, the biggest economy, single economy in the world, and um, we would have wished that this didn't happen, <laughs> but uh, Filipinos love America. <laughs> and uh, what we can say is that it's so easy to have 2020 vision on hindsight. When all this easy money policy was doing, we know was very good for the world, for the, everybody's GDP and everybody and, and our GNP because we have a lot of remittances coming from America. It was all fine. So then, uh, then, uh, then the bubble burst. But did we all know that the bubble was getting to be so big? Uh, Professor Stigler maybe was one of the few who knew that. But everybody was benefiting from American prosperity. And, uh, and as I said, uh, we all didn't want it to happen. Very few saw it happening. So it's not a time for blame tossing. It's a time for looking for the solution. We have a question here. My question is, is it now the time uh, to ask uh, the United States to come back to the system and to have coverage for her currency because uh, printing uh, dollars around the clock and spending it all over the world without uh, coverage, uh, the, only, uh, the only literal decision they made previously, and they have uh, not, not coverage while all the world uh, developed and developing countries, they have coverage for their currency. The only one is the United States have no c coverage and continuing the same. Is this possible, fair and just for uh, being America like this? Thank you. Um, a quick answer to that question. Can I echo the, 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 the president that, uh, you know, we don't want to get into uh, this business of blame game. And uh, we, we want uh, action taken. We want whatever um, stimulus there can be um, to sustaining demand and to provide liquidity to all, to all working businesses. That's, that's the imperative thing. Um, the system has never been fair. And uh, we, we recognize that. And uh, in, in truth, um, while we, with hindsight, we can say, oh, somebody has been overspending, the truth is actually a lot of the world benefited from that overspending. And so, you know, you could, you could turn the question around and say, well, 
uh, is the rest of the world to blame as well for not uh, telling the overspenders when times were good. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think we should be uh, engaged in this, but uh, uh, really to look for, for solutions. And the one concern that I have, I mean, there's a lot of mention today about uh, coordination and expanding even the G20. But the fact of the matter is, even if you had, say, the G100 or even over 100, um, I'm not sure that it is sufficient um, to deal with the, the current global um, economy. Uh, because the grouping will not have a mandate to actually force actions on the part of national governments. We live in a global economy, but we only have national authorities. Who's going to force the countries with the, with the reserve surplus and tell them, please release your surplus reserves to help the countries that need them? Unless we can come up with that kind of, of, of system and governance, which is going to be extremely difficult because of the implications on, on, on sovereignty and, uh, and democracies and national democracies, um, that, that's a tough one uh, to crack. Even, even, even the Professor Stiglitz's suggestion that the UN uh, takes this on. Well, even in, on matters of security, do we believe that the UN is, is, is powerful enough to enforce what is needed when a crisis comes and somebody has to actually take the hard decision. On that note, I'm afraid we're, we're out of time, but I would just like to um, thank uh, the Prime Minister, the President of the Philippines, Mr. Guria, Mr. Miochi, Mr. Monks, Professor Stieglitz, and I'd like to just sum up really what uh, has been, I think, the consensus from uh, this session rebooting the global economy. Uh, while there is disagreement about what form the healing process will be, there is a consensus that the credit markets need to be repaired and will be repaired uh, in the months to come, that G20 is essential to that process, that job creation is also considered essential to that process, that global financial regulation uh, has come and is needed, and uh, completing Doha with an emphasis, as Professor Stieglitz said, on the developing countries um, increasingly. And um, let's just remember that uh, what got us here was that uh, there was uh, a combination of mishaps on the banks and banking industry, regulators, and uh, the government. Unfortunately, you could ask the question, what else is new? But um, may everybody have a good year. Thank you very much. Thank you.